My name is Mark Polk and this is my RV garage. I got bit by the RV bug when I was 15 years old and still have it today. I started in this industry washing campers and since that time I've helped educate over a quarter million RVers on how to safely and properly use and maintain their RV. My favorite pastimes are RVs, muscle cars, and motorcycles. Welcome to my RV garage. This episode of Mark's RV Garage is sponsored in part by Camping World, KOA, Explorer RV Insurance, ASA Electronics, and Dometic. Today we're going to install our refrigerator. This is a Dometic refrigerator model number RM2354. Its compact size will work great in the old Yellowstone and it's a three-way refrigerator. What that means is it will work in three different modes. 12 volt DC power, 120 volt AC power, and LP gas. When you install a refrigerator, it's extremely important that it's done properly so the heat created behind the refrigerator can be vented up and out. There are two installations that will work with this model refrigerator. You can enclose the refrigerator and vent it up to a vent installed on the roof, or you can use an upper and lower vent like these. If you choose to use the side vents like we'll do today, you also need to install a power vent fan to assist with pulling that heat from up behind the refrigerator and out the upper side vent. I would like to thank Dometic for sending us this three-way refrigerator for the restoration project. To see a complete line of RV refrigerators and lots of other great RV products, take a minute to visit www.dometic.com. Before we can install the refrigerator, we need to frame in our cabinet that it will be mounted on, so I better get busy. Another new addition to the old Yellowstone trailer. We have a Hamilton Beach microwave complements of ASA Electronics. And basically what we're doing is uh, we're framing in our cabinet base. We're going to mount our refrigerator up here, microwave directly below the refrigerator, put a cabinet face on here, and it'll be flush mounted right into the cabinet. Very cool. And it puts us one step closer to finishing the interior. Okay, we've, we've cut out our lower side vent and we're getting ready to cut out our upper side vent. Of course, that's where the heat will come up and go out. And then uh, we'll be able to go in, finish building the cabinet for the refrigerator and get it installed hopefully today. Getting closer to installing our refrigerator, you can see we've got our lower vent and our upper vents cut out. And it's important when you install an RV refrigerator that you have zero clearance on the sides, top, and bottom. 
So that's what we're doing is building these sections so when we slide our refrigerator in, the only place for the heat to go is in the back and it goes up and out. If we left an air pocket somewhere and that heat could come up here and sit, it's going to affect the efficiency of the, of the refrigerator. So we're going to get this closed in and then try to get the refrigerator installed. Okay, if you're using the uh, upper and lower side vents as opposed to a roof vent with this model refrigerator, you have to install a power ventilator fan to help pull the heat up and out, and that's what we're getting ready to do. We're going to install it approximately in the center over the condenser in the refrigerator, and then I'm actually going to wire a rocker switch and mount it up here when we get our uh, facing on so I can control when the fan is, comes on and off. When I'm using the refrigerator, I'll just flip the switch. When I'm not using the refrigerator, I'll turn it off so it, there's no chance of it draining my battery. And we want the, the fan airflow facing out. All right, and we'll do our wiring after we slide our refrigerator in. Okay, as we were working on the enclosure for the refrigerator, we were going to take this all the way up to the ceiling and, and it was just going to be wasted space and then Don came up with the idea to just turn this into a shell which will work out really nice just to keep some whatever in so we still have an airtight seal for our refrigerator and we're going to end up with a nice cubby hole to uh, store things in Okay, if you recall, when we were installing the, the TV antenna, I still had my coax cable and my power cord that we routed across the roof, but we have to get it down to the television. And I wanted to do that inside the refrigerator compartment. So now, I'm going to go ahead and drill a hole through the roof. We're going to use this plate, run our cables, put some die core sealing on here, screw it down to the roof so it's sealed, route our cables down through the refrigerator compartment and come out at the TV. What we want to do is just, hopefully I made my hole big enough to get these both through. Yep. We'll eventually run it down inside our refrigerator compartment. All I'm going to do is, I've already got my butyl tape on there. I'm just going to fill these grooves just right here so when we press down on that it'll be sealed from underneath and then we'll seal around our screws. Okay that's our cable coming into our plate. We've got our die core on uh, sealing up the cables and then our butyl tape. Just want to run the screws down until a little bit of butyl tape comes out around the edge. Okay, we've got the, got our mounting plate finished on the roof, and now we just want to put this in the rear corner out of the way. And right here in this bottom corner is where we're going to go ahead and run those cables over to our television. We're just going to have to seal this hole up. Now we can get around to finish hooking up our TV antenna and our touch pad. Okay, I think we're at a stage now where we can test fit the refrigerator in the opening 
look for any last minute adjustments but we're going to have to do a little bit of insulating and a few things before we can actually secure it and make our connections our gas and 110 and 12 volt connections but we can test fit it to make sure that the opening is going to work Okay, here's a test bit of the refrigerator and you're looking at it from the rear at the lower vent and you can see we've got zero clearance on the sides and the bottom which is really good and then if you look at the upper vent you can see that fan that we're going to hook up the power fan that's going to pull that heat up and out so the installation is going really well we're just going to have to make some final adjustments and then we can connect our gas, our 12 volt, and our 120 volt power. The other day we test fitted our refrigerator in the enclosure and now we removed it, we sealed all our edges with adhesive, we routed our wires, we're going to trim the side and front and then we're going to install the refrigerator for good. Okay, we made our gas connection at the refrigerator. We're getting ready to do our 12 volt connection. The 120 is just a matter of dropping our cord down and being able to plug it into an outlet. Uh, we're going to go ahead and hook up our ventilator fan now. And what we have is a, a limit switch, which will open at 90 degrees and close at 105. So when that rocker switch is turned on, this will tell the fan when the temperature up here reaches a certain degree it'll activate the fan when it cools it down uh, to 90 it'll shut it off so we're going to mount our limit switch make our connections make our 12 volt connection and then the refrigerator is basically finished okay we've got all our wiring done uh, we're going to make our 12 volt connections at the refrigerator to our positive side and our negative side so we've got our 12 volt power and our ventilator fan on the positive side. Make a good connection. And then we've got our 12 volt negative and our ventilator fan negative. It just goes into our negative side. tuck everything away, make sure it's not going to be rubbing up against anything sharp. All right, the last step to the refrigerator is to get our flare and make it our connection to the gas supply. Okay, we're, we're actually making our final connections to the touchpad for the motorized TV antenna. We've got our coax and our booster wired and um, once we install this, the TV antenna will be complete. 
and it's just a matter of all the wiring's finished, so it's just a matter of plugging our cables in. And then we'll finish mounting the box. And the only thing left after this will be to test it out. Whenever you're wiring an RV, there are certain electrical codes that need to be adhered to, and one of the most important is when it comes to ground fault circuit interrupters or GFCIs. A GFCI is nothing more than an outlet that will trip and cut the electricity off in the event that you're exposed, it's exposed to moisture or water, and somebody might get harmed by that. When it comes to RVs and electrical codes, Whenever there's an outlet in the kitchen area that's close to water, the bathroom close to water, or an outside receptacle, it has to be protected by a GFCI. There's basically two ways you can wire a GFCI. If all the outlets are on one circuit, you can put the GFCI at the first location, and that will protect everything behind that, or you can put one wherever the requirement exists, like in the bathroom, the kitchen, and one out here on the outside, the exterior of the RV. Today we're going to go ahead and install a couple GFCIs and some standard household outlets throughout the Yellowstone trailer. Let's get started. <laughs> This outlet is close to the water. Of course, a lot of the outlets in here are close to water because it's a small trailer. So what we're going to do is we're going to install a GFCI here and protect all the circuit, the, the uh, outlets behind this. So the way to do that is you have what's called your line and your load. The line is what's coming in from the power center, and the load is what's going out to the other outlets. So we want to make sure we wire it properly to protect all of those other outlets. originally laid out the design for the trailer, I had it in mind to put the microwave above the kitchen sink, but when that didn't work out and we located it under our refrigerator, I had to run a dedicated 120 volt line to the microwave so it'll be on its own uh, circuit.
Don't miss the next episode when Mark installs a brand new tankless water heater and gets ready to start testing some of the systems in the old Yellowstone trailer. A common problem associated with RVs is dead batteries. There are numerous reasons for dead batteries, including not fully charging the battery after using it, parasitic loads on the battery, lack of maintenance, and overcharging, just to name a few. To help prevent some of these battery-related problems on the old Yellowstone, we're going to install a SunForce 15-watt solar battery charger. Let's head up on the roof and get started. The installation is pretty simple. There are four pre-drilled holes along with rubber washers to help with heat dissipation. You just mount the panel to the roof and seal the screws with an approved sealant. Since we don't have the metal on the outside of the trailer yet, I am going to route the wiring through the studs in the wall, bringing it out close to the battery connections. It is possible for this solar panel to overcharge the battery, so for now I plan to use the battery clamp connectors to hook it up when I want the solar panel to charge the battery. There is an optional SunForce 7 amp solar charge controller available to prevent the battery from overcharging. That's all there is to it. Now when I want to take advantage of the sun to help keep my battery topped off, all I have to do is connect the battery clamps to the battery. This solar panel can generate one amp per hour under ideal conditions. When I don't want to chance the battery overcharging, I can disconnect it and store the ends in the battery box. For more information on the SunForce 15 watt solar battery charger, go to www.campingworld.com. Here's a little RV trivia for you. Ray Frank is the man credited with the term motorhome. In 1953, he built a house car for his family's use and called it a motorhome. From 58 to 62, Ray Frank was building Frank motorhomes on Dodge chassis in Brown City, Michigan. In the early 60s, he started developing the fiberglass body motorhomes that would later be used in the Travco Dodge motorhome design. 131 Travcos were built the first year with an average selling price of $9,000. One of the motorhomes used by Charles Kuralt and his on-the-road crew for CBS News was a Travco. Ray Frank was inducted into the RV Hall of Fame as the father of the motorhome. At Explorer RV, insuring motorhomes, bus conversions, travel trailers, park trailers, and fifth wheels is our specialty. And our coverages are custom designed to meet the needs of the RV lifestyle. To that end, we offer many benefits unavailable through typical insurance agencies, including total loss replacement, purchase price guarantees, personal effects coverage, awning replacement coverage, towing, and more. Choose the RV insurance experts. Choose Explorer RV. When you hear all the talk about the shape of the economy, it only makes sense to buckle down and take better care of what you already own. Today I want to discuss some easy ways to increase the life of your tow vehicle or motorhome's engine. It's really not difficult to do. Let's look at some basic preventive maintenance procedures to help increase the life of any engine. It doesn't matter if it's your tow vehicle engine or motorhome engine or whether it's a diesel or gasoline engine. What we want to focus on today are some simple preventive maintenance steps we can take to extend the life of our vehicle's engine. Routine oil and oil filter changes. This is number one on my list. You should follow the vehicle manufacturer guidelines for changing the engine oil and oil filter. If at all possible, try to change the oil and oil filter prior to any long-term storage. Acids accumulate in used oil and can corrode the engine bearings. Don't forget the generator oil and filter too. Help your engine breathe. A dirty or clogged air filter can rob life from your engine. When the engine can breathe properly, it not only lasts longer, but it is more fuel efficient. Recommendations for checking and replacing air filters are normally based on driving conditions. It only takes a few minutes to check the air filter. 
I check mine when I change the engine oil and it gets replaced if it's dirty. Pay attention to service intervals. The manufacturer recommends service intervals for a reason. You guessed it, to maximize efficiency and extend the life of the engine. Whether it's a diesel or gasoline engine, it's important that you pay attention and follow these recommended service intervals. Keep it running cool. Just like clean engine oil lubricates moving parts and extends the engine's life, clean engine antifreeze helps the major components of the engine stay cool and extends the engine's life. Follow the engine manufacturer guidelines for flushing and replacing the coolant. Make sure you use the proper type of coolant for the engine and every time you lift the hood, check the coolant level and inspect coolant hoses for any damage. Coolant hoses deteriorate from the inside out. Inspect all hoses for wear, cracks, soft spots, brittle areas, and leaks. Replace any damaged hoses or clamps as required. Perform pre-trip checks. Before moving the RV, make the following checks concerning the engine. Check all fluid levels in the transmission, power steering, engine coolant, engine oil, windshield washer, and brake fluid. Consult your vehicle owner's manual for proper levels. Start the engine, allow it to reach operating temperature, and check for proper readings on all of the gauges. Look under the vehicle for any signs of leaks. Have any leaks checked out and repaired before using the vehicle. Driving is important too. Smart drivers can extend the life of their vehicle engine. Watching RPMs, knowing when to shift gears, and monitoring gauges all contribute to extending the life of your engine. Always warm an engine up before driving. Don't race a cold engine. Accelerate slowly until the engine is up to operating temperature. Always monitor your gauges and if a gauge is reading outside of the normal operating range, pull over when it's safe and have it checked out and repaired. A little bit of preventive maintenance can pay big dividends in the long run. What's the old saying? An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure? It's easy to do and you'll be glad you did it when you get years of trouble-free service from your RV or tow vehicle engine. I've produced over 15 DVDs to teach you how to use and maintain your RV and I'm the author of three books that cover everything you need to know about your RV. Take a look at what we have to offer you and happy camping. Four DVD value sets. In an effort to make it easier for you to learn about your RV, we took four of our individual DVD titles and put them together in a full set for the type of RV you own. These value sets are equivalent to almost three hours of one-on-one -on -one personal instruction. Not only does this eliminate the guesswork as to which DVDs go together, but you also save a significant amount of money with the box set discount. After watching this four DVD set, you will master your own RV experiences. Time to clean up and get out of here. Remember, your total RV experience will be enhanced through your RV education. Until next time, safe travels and happy camping.